Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm here with an August wrap up video. I was gonna get changed, like pretend this was a new day, but I won't lie to you. I'm bulk filming today because I had a bit of energy. So sorry that I'm wearing the same t-shirt, but hopefully the content uh, remains the same. Also, I was gonna go and get all of these books off the bookshelf and hold them up. And then I was like, is that more effort? Because I just rearranged part of my bookshelf and put some, I know some of these are at the bottom pile. Is that more effort than me having to edit in the little pictures, which is, if you ask anyone who makes videos about books, the worst part of editing is putting in the stupid little thumbnail pictures. Um, but today, perhaps, I will regret this later, but I decided I'll just put them in for everything. Anyway, that's a ramble. These are the books I read in August. Um, I'm just going to follow the list down my story graph. So the first book I read was, well, not the first, but the first one on my list is Before We Were Trans, A New History of Ginger. Ginger? gender by dr kit hey am this i listened to via libra fm um and i really enjoyed it so this is as the title suggests a new history of gender um dr kit hey am is a queer historian focusing on non the history of non-binary and trans people and they in this book seek to understand not the mistakes, but I guess the um, different ways that trans and non-binary in a lot of cases um, and gender non-conforming people of history have been erased or their lives have been manipulated to fit an understanding of gender that was available at the time. And perhaps um, they argue that may that may continue to happen in the future as we proceed to see politics move the way it does both in the UK and the US around the conversation. Um, and the rolling back of rights for trans and gender non-conforming people. So it is a very nuanced and rich storytelling that um, illustrates the picture of each of these historical figures that they're talking about. So it moves way from like way, 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 way back, like Greek and Roman times to um, Victorian England, Tudor England, and then like turn of the 19th Oh my goodness, I thought that was a wasp, it was just a reflection in the window. Um, 19th century and then turn of the 20th century up until, say, like the last 50 years, um, which is mostly Western focused, but at the same time, they are talking a lot about different societies outside of like the Western bubble that perhaps the, his the history world talks about when we talk about um, gender non-conforming hi history um, to talk about like two-spirit people and uh, communities in India and uh, Pacific Island and all those kind of conversations, but with, it does it with such nuance and is not attempting to be an expert on those things, is quoting from a lot of other sources and also illustrating sort of the damaging rhetoric that perhaps white and Western trans and non-binary people have incidentally or purposefully co-opted in language choices and conversations around... Um, gender without this is obviously not a book attacking any of those things it's merely providing context and understanding to um trans history and i think it does a really good job of that um they are british but it does talk a lot about different places around the world and different periods of history but there's a lot of yeah just nuance but told the stories are really told with empathy and understanding to not suggest like I can't believe we misgendered this person in history because they were actually like this it, and it really has combed through with a, a fine tooth comb about how people are perceived and why we can't ever say something certain about a previous part of history particularly when we're talking about a person from a marginalized group in history um why we have a lack of like evidence or um, records of people why people there's no way you can say why a person did a certain thing if they're no longer alive to speak to it themselves so I think they do a really good job in that um and they offer what well, I think is quite a radical and like I say empathetic um exploration of history in this particular subgenre and I really really liked it would recommend the audio then I finally read a short story collection that my friend Jay gave me last summer when he visited in Amsterdam and I can't believe it's taken me a year to read it because I loved it so 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 much this is I Hold a Wolf by the Ears by Laura Vanderberg and um, these are a collection of fabulous and uh slightly fantastical with a very eerie and deeply disturbing undertone but quite refined in that sense it's not um it's not full dystopia it's very much grounded in reality and understandings of the way the world works now but there are these tidbits of um 
I guess, little objects left within the stories that make you sort of doubt the world that you're reading about. And in a way that I found really satisfying and enjoyable to read. Um, it deals a lot with loss and relationships, like social relations with people, grief, um, not just romance, but sisters and mother daughters and sort of the entanglement of those that web of social connections you build without your life and how through one of those dropping can turn your entire world upside down and i think it did a really good job at um understanding all the different ways it did that i'm i'm really like struggled to pick a favorite story i was texting jay as i was reading it like i love that one okay i've read four and i love them all okay i'm halfway through and i can't find one i hated um there's one story called Lizards about a man who's basically drugging his wife late at night with this, like, I guess it's it's like, uh, with like some kind of San Pellegrino type bougie sparkling water that's actually laced with sedatives. Um, and the background of that story is Brett Kavanaugh and post Me Too and compliance and defiance in women. And I really liked how eerie and yeah, with a light touch that she uses the fantastical to create a really like evocative stories. Um, and I think they are women focused and women led, but they are backgrounded, like I say, by pop culture references for like Brett Kavanaugh and those sorts of ongoing conversations about gender equality. And um, yeah, I just thought it was really, really good. I'm just like thinking back to the stories, like they're gonna stick with me for a long time. They're one of the, two sisters in Iceland and parts of that story about these two girls traveling reminded me so much of traveling with my best friend when I was a lot younger and it really made me laugh um, and then there's a, a deeply disturbing but brilliant story about um set in Mexico City in the aftermath of an earthquake about brother sister relationships and understanding that your family members are flawed and even could be horribly violent people and coming to reckon with your own bias and what like familial and like the idea that blood is thicker than water what that lens it puts on your life and your ability to be objective to awful and horrible situations um and the idea of justice and standing by people and loyalty and i thought yeah the way she talks about family loyalty and family connection is um really thought-provoking in that one. Oh, my legs are numb guys um then i read early in the month when i was in helsinki with tom i read tove jansen's the summer book tove jansen is the creator of the moomins and if i haven't mentioned it before where is it um the moomins is like a childhood love of me and my mum and obviously had the best time in helsinki buying and just looking at all the moomin merchandise and i felt like it was the perfect place to read this book um my mum's read all of Tove Janssen's like adult work and loved it and was badgering me to read this last summer, no two summers ago when we took a trip to France together and I hadn't picked it up and so it felt really fitting to read it while we were in Finland so it is a novel but oh guys I literally my pet pig's been here the whole time I give up meat fodder waddle pig um the it's a novel but like a autobiographical story and it's about a grandmother and a granddaughter who have a small island off the Swedish no off the Finnish archipelago and there's a group of islands and I always forget because Tove Jansson is Swede Finnish like she's a bit of both um and they go there every summer on this little rowing boat and they have like a very head back set up of this small house and they fish and they go out in the boat and they grow a garden together and it's a very slow piece of nature writing that's really beautiful and um soft and I really enjoyed reading it particularly while I was in Finland and I look forward to reading the winter book later this um year to keep it going then I read and hated I listened to a few audiobooks earlier in the month while I was away with Tom we listened to Sea State by Tabitha Lassley and I'm sorry to my patrons who listened to me and Tom rant about this book in um, our recent podcast because we hated this book. I'm sorry if you've read it and you liked it. I think it suffers from a lot of things and without being, without ranting to you like I did on the podcast, I will just say it's, it's entirely mismarketed and that's what does it such a disservice. And it's notable to mention that in the paperback production of this book, they've tagged on a memoir at the end of the 
um, title, which wasn't in our audio version and isn't in the hardback version that was originally released, because this book claims to be a story of oil rigging off the coast of Scotland, an investigation into toxic masculinity and gender relations within the oil rigging industry, but is in fact a story of Tabitha Lassie's affair with an oil rigger um, after a breakdown of her relationship in London, and it is entirely based on her own experience and with very little investigative journalism tagged onto the end of it, and that's why. I took such a problem with this, as well as the fact she has so many problematic opinions that are unnecessary to bring in the book. She's very anti-sex work, she's very anti-Northern, she makes some awfully misguided comments about women from the North and how her London boyfriend wouldn't let her watch ITV because it was too Northern and just like utter fucking classes bullshit that was just so bad and then moreover it was just a disappointing story because it did nothing that it was said it was going to do and i think that's why i found it so frustrating so literally zero out of five for this one but an audiobook i adored was her majesty's royal coven by juno dawson this is the start of juno dawson's new adult fantasy series which i know are not words you expect to come out of my mouth because i don't really read a lot of fantasy but i love juno dawson like as a human being i think she's just really cool she's one of those people that i love to watch their Instagram stories of just them talking about like her life and her dog and she lived not far from me on the south coast when I lived in England and yeah I just like her as a person her like new adult books are what got me back into reading when I was like 18 19 and um she's also written some cool handbooks and guides for young trans people and she does a lot of writing about that as well but this is a start of a trilogy I believe it's going to be perhaps more about a coven of witches so I listened to this on audio and I really adored the narration it's narrated by Nicola Coughlin from Bridgerton fame but as many of you will know her as do I from Derry Girls um so that's also just like a wonderful listening experience so the, Her Majesty's Royal Coven is a like the biggest coven in the UK um the sort of I guess mainstream coven hence the imitation of her majesty's whatever we call it revenue and collections <laughs> hmrc and it's a group of friends who are operating in and outside of the coven there's a break off splintering that happened following a war um and reckoning with black lives matter and so we follow the story of that coven alongside the mainstream coven and then we meet a character who is a young trans woman who wants to enter this coven which is obviously historically centered a lot about cis womanhood and sisterhood and it turns out that the leader of this coven is a massive turf and we go into those nuanced stories but outside of that storyline which obviously is traumatic but brings up some really interesting and moments of levity and dark humor that uh, Juno Dawson's using to talk about something that's important like this and I didn't find a lot of fantasy that I've read in the past or even dystopian that I've read in the past that tries to tackle socio-political issues or human rights issues like this I feel like I'm being schooled in it or bashed over the head with the content of the author whether that's bigoted or um agrees with what I agree with um but it didn't feel like this in this because it had that dark humor because it had multiple plot lines going on it didn't just feel like a thin, a thin thinly veiled attempt at defending transness because i don't think juno dawson would ever do that because that would be stooping below who she is as a writer if that makes sense like this book was so much more than that but that being a central tenant of the story made it unique and compelling to read and just a brilliant story honestly like i like witchy stuff i don't love witchy stuff but I was enthralled by the characters, like I say, by the narration and that um, nuanced discussion of turfs and those conversations within the context of this fantasy world were really interesting. And yeah, I would highly, highly recommend if you are at all inclined to read books that are set outside of reality or if like me, that's not something you enjoy, but you think this sounds interesting to you, then I recommend it, particularly on audio. Um, another soft nature book I read earlier this month was Seven Steeples by Sarah Balm, my friend. Katrina sent me this earlier in the summer. Yeah, it was like a post-hospital gift a while ago. And um, I haven't read, is it A Line Made by Walking? Sarah Balm's other book, which a lot of people love. But this is a, I should have got it to hold up for you because it's a really beautiful like square book published by Tramp Press. And it tells the story of two people who 
are living in they're living in a city in Ireland and then they basically sell everything they own and move out to like the extreme rural area near a mountain next to a farmer in the middle of nowhere and we follow them over seven years and there's a lot of repetition of seven it's a very experimental book that deals with um lots of different topics but in a very playful almost um Max Porter-ish way perhaps not on the page but lyrically and it does have this dark isolation undertone to it we watch them withdraw further and further from society essentially to become hermit-like and at the same time engross themselves in the nature that surrounds them and it's a very slow book a plotless book a not even a character study really these people are stand-ins for anybody's but they are talking a lot about engrossment with each other and then detachment from the from reality or the real world in this slightly unsettling way but I was at one point expecting something tragic or I don't know monumental to happen in the story but it didn't which was fine um but I felt perhaps slightly set up for that but it's not really it's just this bubbling undercurrent of isolation I think particularly reading it in the context of now given the like the recent history we've just had of isolation and periods of loneliness um it was particularly unsettling but not in a bad way so if you're into experimental nature writing or stories of rural island or relationships um slow living it was yeah realistic i guess in that sense as well it wasn't pandering to a you know like a faux naturist kind of point of view of like how how gorgeous is it and wouldn't you just love to run away to the woods like it doesn't do that it really clings on to that idea of isolation and detachment i guess and who are you without all the stuff that surrounds you and without doing stuff like they sort of lose sense of time of birthdays of attachment to any family or friends in a way that feels purposeful but almost once they reach a certain point they feel like they can't go back so they are just living in basically isolation as the two of them and it was I guess by the end of it I felt quite sad and empty for them but it also was reflecting a lot on materiality and consumerism and capitalism all those things so yeah it was a very thoughtful book and crept up on me I guess so would recommend then I listened to I think like half of the internet population um, and I also have half of an essay on it written I will promise to put out on bookish soon I'm glad my mom died by Jeanette McCurdy again sorry because me and Tom talked about this on Patreon so feel free to fast forward patrons but this is a book uh, Jeanette McCurdy was Sam in iCarly which is a Nickelodeon TV show that was big when I was growing up I'm not sure Lots of different people of different ages have been reading and talking about this. So I think she, I guess, iCarly not had a renaissance, but maybe came back into the cultural, like, conversation with meme culture. And what's her name? The main iCarly is Miranda someone. And I think they perhaps had an online presence post iCarly. But anyway, if you see a picture of Jeanette McCurdy and you watch Nickelodeon growing up, you will recognise who Sam was. She was like the blonde sidekick. Anyway, this tells the story of Jeanette McCurdy's experience as a child actor, being part of iCarly and all of the stuff that was a precursor to that for her. She started acting at the age of six and it tells the story of Hollywood, of predatory behaviour by producing men, by being strung along by casting agents and just like exploitative child labour practices within Hollywood. So you've got that on this side. Then you've got Jeanette McCurdy's home life where she has this emotionally manipulative, questionably sexually question mark. If you guys read, if you've read this, please DM me about the whole shower thing because that honestly disturbed me and talking about ages. This um, emotionally manipulative, abusive mum that she grows up with at home who forces her into child acting. Jeanette McCurdy says in the book, like from the day I tried it, I never wanted to do it again. And here I was 18 years later. So you have these two harrowing storylines going back to back with each other, with the macro issues, her experience in Hollywood, and then her home life. And it just feels insufferable at points. Like you are surrounded by her trauma. And it's a very traumatizing book to read, particularly if you have any experience with disordered eating. That's a huge trigger warning, as well as, like I say, sexual assault, emotional abuse, narcissistic mothering, all of those things, it's it's pretty non-stop. But I think, and I've said this before, like brave is such a shit word, but I think it's a very accomplished book and 
it felt like sort of the, the McCurdy couldn't have written it any other way. Like this was a very vulnerable and open book, but it was the only way to tell this story. And it was so funny. I was texting one of my friends who was reading it and she was like, at first I thought maybe the um, the title was tongue in cheek or like she comes from a, a family with like strong family values and like was a bit turned off, I guess, by the title. Um, but then she like updated to be like three chapters in like, okay, I get it. And I was like, yeah, you get it. Um, and her mum passes away from cancer and then a part of the book is her reflecting on romanticising of the dead, how her mum passing away gives gave her closure on this experience of her life and how that is what she means when she says I'm glad my mum died, like she never would have escaped without her and she never would have been able to, I guess, be the person that she is now without ridding that bit of her which her and her because her mum was narcissistic had was like a limpet on her was like even when she tried to move out she was at one point like funding her entire family and extended family's life because she came from a working class background also if you know me you know I love religiosity there's some great tidbits in here about her family's relationship to Mormonism and going back and forth between church and God and acting and how those things all met together and yeah I just think it was good the I always get epilogue and prologue mixed up. The finishing chapter is like one of the best things I've ever listened to about how we need to tear down the sanctity of motherhood because it's harming so many people, mothers and children included. And I think it was so well done. So yeah, love that. I'm sure loads of you have already listened to it, but if you haven't, give it a whirl. It's on script now, so you can listen if you're a member. And if you're not a plug, you can get months free below with my link. Um, and then I read The Pachinko Parlour by Eliza Shua Duaspim, translated, and it's by Daunt Books. Um, this um, author also wrote Winter in Sokcho. Sorry, I'm not even going to edit out these bits, guys. No, I'm really in a my fuck it era of making videos, so excuse the pauses. But this tells the story of... A young woman who is in Tokyo for the summer and she sort of nanny slash teaches this young girl who's from like a uh not even a wealthy background but just like quite an odd situation they live in this hotel building and her mother goes out to work and she's teaching her and then we flip between that life and her relationship she's building with this 10 year old girl to her grandparents who run a pachinko parlor in Tokyo and the outskirts of Tokyo but they are Korean and came over in that same era and uh, Claire and wants to take her grandparents back to Korea to understand the history and the relationship between Korea and Japan if you read Pachinko the book then this is almost like a microcosm present day of that story like it touches on those same things and I'm glad I've read Pachinko before I read this because I think that provides the historical context you need to understand part of the relationship obviously just one book is not going to explain it all but to understand part of the relationship between Korea and Japan, particularly during the wars. So I think this was um, a quiet book, but an interesting book. I loved the interaction between her and her granddad and the parlor shiny that he runs and sort of the sordid history with Pachenko parlors. And then there's, I don't want to spoil the ending, but this scene at the end, and it's a really full circle moment of if, people like particularly older people who are migrants people who have moved abroad at young ages who've set up new lives somewhere if they really ever want to go home and what home is for them particularly if they fled somewhere because of conflict or violence or all those reasons why you would leave somewhere um and want to forget about it and it's interesting because I was having a conversation with my friend Lila who is German Egyptian about we were talking about her family experience and stuff and she was saying a similar thing about her relationship with her dad and um the idea of losing your heritage on purpose in order to assimilate into a new place and i think because um japan and korea from a western perspective perhaps hold a lot of similarities that it feels like um it wouldn't seem like so much of cultural assimilation but because of the distrust and mistreatment of korean people living in japan during those times and the prejudice that continues up until today um it was really interesting to look at those nuances and consider yeah the lives of korean people living in japan um working in and outside of businesses that are considered like inappropriate by 
Japanese culture and yeah I think it did a really interesting job of looking at that through a contemporary lens and I really enjoyed it did I read anything else oh my goodness I'm talking for ages guys this is what happens when I don't film for a bit I read Milk Tea by Jessica Andrews finally this is the second book her sophomore novel um and it is a story of unrequited sort of love and I read this by the pool on holiday and it was the perfect read it's set between um the UK and Barcelona and the Barcelona scenes I love so much and it really made me laugh because I got Tom to read it straight after me and um the young <laughs> the young like love interest in this is like an academic studying who moves to Barcelona and the girl follows him and I was like huh sounds a bit like us Tom and he was not impressed not if you read this when I compared him to the boy in this which made me laugh but it's also a lot about food and eating and disordered eating so similar content warnings for this um but I think the way that Jessica Andrews writes about food both in a positive light and the culture of 2000s heroin chic Kate Moss skinny girl um disordered eating was really good I'm tentative to suggest it as a a salve for those kinds of stories because it is so deeply explorative that it could be I don't know irresponsible I guess to suggest it to someone who's struggling but I think um it did a really good job of like painting that in a nuanced way Jessica Andrews is a straight-sized person so take that into account when you are reading it it's definitely not like it is like full of internalized fat phobia I guess in terms of the characters but a part of it is told in the second person similar if you've read open water so if that's a turn off for you you won't like this but I thought it was done really well and it it yeah it really dripped of lust and uh sexiness and young love and I really enjoyed that bit of it I think perhaps it would be a little I don't want to say risque, but like people might find that cringe. But I think she does that lustful writing really well. Um, and yeah, I think it was a really, a really good story. So don't have many intelligent thoughts on it. Sorry, <laughs> but I really, really liked it. Then I read my Bay P R K P K R Patrick Redden Keith his essay collection that came out early in the summer. Rogues, true stories of grifters, killers, rebels, and crooks. This is a combination of all, well, not all, but like his most popular essays from his time at the New Yorker so technically you could find all of these online although most of them will be paywalled so perhaps people will think it's cash grab to publish them but I really enjoyed reading them in this form and I just like poured over the pages of his introduction and talking about his experience as a writer as a journalist and everything that goes into making these investigative stories and it really like lit a fire under me to want to pursue that kind of writing because I, I absolutely love to read investigation stories and I think he writes them like no other and he talks a little bit about the way that he tells the stories but he lets the writing do it for himself if you've never read a Patrick Rand and Keefe essay he turns a lot of the most popular true crime or um yeah big investigative stories of the time on their heads he finds another way in so he tells the story of the Heineken Kidnappers, which is like one of the most infamous stories in Dutch true crime about a um, two best friends who kidnapped the son of the Heineken boss and held him for ransom and then go on to be these like mega um, underworld people in Amsterdam. Um, but he, instead of telling that story as it is, which has been told by loads of papers and has a book about it, he interviews and tells the story of the sister who turned on the kidnappers um she was a trained attorney and worked for them for a long time and then informed on them and turned them into the police and now lives in hiding and he is really reflexive in his writing and he talks about meeting her in all the different places and why she has an armored car if he believes the car is armored if he believes she's out of the risk that she says she is and um he's not nitpicking but he's really just like hot on the detail and the the nuance to the stories to make sure he's not just contributing to the sensationalism and I really appreciated that in his writing the stories of the Lockerbie bomber of um Gaddafi of loads of different cultural moments that you will recognize from the past 25 or 30 years but um are yeah rewritten in loads of ways one of my favorite essays is when he meets and talks about uh Anthony Bourdain and he writes in his intro how he has developed knack over the year for writing profiles of people he's 
either never met, will never get to interview, or he meets like sparingly. And the one he wrote on Anthony Bourdain and his eventual suicide was so, so moving. It made me want to re-listen to Kitchen Confidential, which I don't think I've read since I was like 16. Um, but I, um, yeah, I just think he's such a brilliant writer and I'll read anything he writes. And this collection is no exception. It was actually really enjoyable to read him in short form. Um, and I understand from a career perspective, he can't push out books like um, Empire of Pain and uh, Say Nothing, like year on year, because those are huge projects to take on. So I was happy to get my PKR fixed while I could. I think that is all the books I read. I've got Drums in the Distance here, Journeys into the Global Far Right, which I talked about in a vlog. And I think I also wrapped up in my July wrap up. I can't remember. I feel like I've talked enough anyway it was a middling book about different factions of the far right and I thought the author was a bit self-centered so that's my thoughts on that one um let me know what you read in August if you had a good reading month and what you're looking forward to reading in the next few months see you guys in the next one bye